Tourniquets save lives. That's not marketing, that's fact. But the way we use them and the way they're built has changed over centuries. We designed ours with one goal, to make sure you actually carry one. Because a tourniquet in your pocket beats the one left at home on the nightstand or in your glove compartment. The American College of Surgeons makes this urgent. Uncontrolled bleeding is a leading cause of preventable death. And empowering people with simple tools and training saves lives. Now, before we get any further into this video, we want to make one thing clear. This video isn't a how-to guide or training on tourniquet application. Our goal here is to help you understand why these devices work, how they've evolved, understanding their limitations, and what makes each design suited for different situations. In future videos, we'll go hands-on, demonstrating proper use, when and where to apply a tourniquet, and how to integrate these skills into everyday carry and real-world scenarios. For now, think of this as the foundation, the context behind the tool, because understanding how it works is the first step towards using it responsibly. Every tourniquet, no matter the type, does one thing. It applies circumferential pressure. You're compressing soft tissue against bone to pinch off the artery that is pushing blood away from the heart and out through a wound. Veins collapse first. That's easy. The challenge is occluding the artery, the deeper, higher pressure vessel. That's why the device must tighten far beyond comfort and stay locked there. Windless tourniquets use mechanical advantage. The windlass multiplies your hand strength so you can exceed arterial pressure without tearing your hands apart. The key variables are width, tension, and placement. Too narrow, and you cut deep before compressing wide. Too wide or soft, and you spread pressure without occluding efficiently. It's a balance, one that changes with limb size, tissue density, and time to care. The tourniquet story stretches back over 2,000 years. Early references show Greek and Roman soldiers using leather straps or cords to slow bleeding before surgery. Now they worked, but they also caused massive tissue death when left on too long. In the 1600s, a French surgeon named Etienne Morel tied a stick around a cord and twisted it tight, the first known windlass. A century later, Jean-Louis Petit refined the idea into a device with a mechanical screw. For the first time, medicine had a control over pressure and not just pain. By the American Civil War, soldiers improvised tourniquets from belts, rifle slings, or sticks, often too late or too loose. It took the industrial wars of the 20th century to push standardization. During World War I, battlefield medicine met industrialized warfare for the first time. Artillery and machine gun fire created massive hemorrhaging injuries. And while tourniquets were issued, their use was inconsistent and often misunderstood. Many soldiers still died from blood loss because medics feared leaving a tourniquet in place for too long. Yet forward-thinking surgeons began documenting cases where rapid, firm applications saved lives. Those observations marked the first real shift from hesitation towards acceptance of the tourniquet as a legitimate life-saving tool. By World War II, tourniquet designs had modestly improved with rubber and webbing versions, but doctrine still lagged behind. Training remained inconsistent, and many were applied too loosely to be effective or so tightly they caused injury. Combat surgeons started realizing that properly applied tourniquets, even for extended periods, could save lives. And that the danger lay more in delayed application than the tool itself. Those lessons, learned under fire, began to lay the foundation for modern combat casualty care. During the 1993 Battle of Mogadishu, US soldiers faced catastrophic extremity injuries in intense urban combat. Modern one-hand windless tourniquets that we know today had not yet been developed. The fight exposed a hard truth. Catastrophic bleeding needed immediate, effective control, and existing tools and doctrine weren't enough. That lesson stayed with the community. A decade later, during the global war on terror, those same questions drove research and innovation. Combat medics and trauma surgeons began gathering real data from the field, not theory, but outcomes. The results were clear. Early tourniquet use saves lives, and when applied correctly, limbs can often be salvaged. Out of that era came two devices that reshaped modern pre-hospital bleeding control, the Combat Application Tourniquet, or CAT, and the Special Operations Forces Tourniquet, or SOFT. The Combat Application Tourniquet, developed by North American Rescue, introduced an easy-to-use, one-handed design that could be rapidly self-applied in combat. Its simplicity and accessibility made it the backbone of the COTSI recommendation list for years. The SOFT, designed by TACMED Solutions, refined the concept with all-metal hardware and exceptional durability under extreme conditions. It became the go-to for special operations and high-demand end-users. Together, these two designs defined our modern standard for windless tourniquets. Reliable, 
field tested, and responsible for saving countless lives. We view them not as competitors, but as pioneers, the foundation on which today's innovators stand. From those designs forward, new generations of tourniquets have continued to evolve, smaller, lighter, and more carry-friendly. Our ETQ is part of that lineage, a continuation of a legacy that began centuries ago and was perfected through decades of combat medicine. The modern tourniquet is a result of 2,000 years of trial, bloodshed, and refinement. The simplest, most proven mechanical lifesaver we carry. When we built the ETQ, we didn't try to reinvent physics. We study what works and what people will actually carry. We often get asked about the one inch width. Is it safe to use? And what led us to this design? The answer, this. When we talk about tourniquet design, it's important to start by giving credit where credit's due. The CAT tourniquet is the gold standard. It has saved countless lives, set the benchmark for field reliability, and remains one of the most proven devices in existence. When we began designing the ETQ, we studied what made the CAT effective. Specifically, the way its internal constricting band provides the real arterial compression. If you place the cat under load on a limb or a foam roller and fold the outer sleeve inward, you'll see that the core band doing the work is about one inch wide. That observation inspired us to build our one inch ETQ, a minimalistic, skeletonized version of that proven system designed to be smaller, lighter, and easier to carry every day. We're not claiming to outperform the cat. What we're demonstrating is that both designs work on the same mechanical principle, a narrow band, generating sufficient circumferential pressure to occlude arterial flow when applied correctly. Now for users who need COTSI compliance or greater versatility for larger limbs, we also developed the ETQ wide, which adds that half inch of width, improving performance on larger extremities and spreading occlusion pressure over a wider surface area to help minimize tissue stress during prolonged use. Same ETQ DNA, broader pressure zone, faster and more efficient occlusion on larger limbs. Ultimately, the takeaway isn't necessarily that one design replaces the other. It's the understanding that these systems work, how these systems work, and that choosing the right one for your context can save lives. The CAT and the ETQ both represent different expressions of the same principle, effective, reliable hemorrhage control in the moments that matter most. This isn't a critique of any one device, it's context. Knowing how your gear functions makes you more capable when it matters. As limb circumference increases, occlusion gets harder. That's why stacking tourniquets, two devices, one stacked above the other on the limb, is common. It expands the effective surface area and reduces the required pressure. A wider tourniquet does the same job in one pass, but adds bulk. That's the trade-off. Capability versus carry comfort. A 200-pound soldier and a 120-pound hiker face different realities and different physiology. Arterial occlusion becomes more difficult as limb circumference increases, but invisible variables like blood pressure, artery depth, and vessel calcification matter too. Test the tourniquet on your own limbs. Every device fails to occlude at some size. Green Beret Nick Lavery's story drives it home. He sustained catastrophic limb trauma overseas, multiple tourniquets, direct pressure from his own hand, and sheer will kept him alive. And there's just a river flowing from oh, where I man. was to where I was originally struck. So I know my femoral artery has been severed. And uh, we had a ton of medical training leading up to that deployment, and we got a lot of medical training during that deployment, right, in real time. So I know that I have maybe eight, nine minutes left before I'm completely bled out. Okay. Tourniquet. Pull a tourniquet off my kit. I get that up on, wrench that down as tight as I can, lock in the windlass, and uh, bleeding doesn't stop. It's like visibly still pouring out of my leg. So I grab a second tourniquet, and I slap that on, wrench that down. Um, it's mass hysteria. His experience isn't an indictment of any device. It's a reminder that one tourniquet isn't a guarantee. Redundancy, awareness, and training make the difference. A tourniquet stops blood, and with it, oxygen. The longer it stays on, the more tissue you risk losing. Narrower bands concentrate that pressure into nerves and muscle. Wider bands spread it out, buying time and comfort if evacuation takes hours. In an urban environment where help is minutes away and time to definitive care is typically less than an hour, a compact one-inch ETQ makes sense. In remote or tactical environments, 
a wide variant gives you margin. Match your gear to your environment. Gear isn't magic. Skill beats equipment every time. Whatever you carry, practice with it. Learn to self-apply one-handed. Learn to apply to someone else. In the dark, under pressure, test your tourniquet. Put it on your leg, count your turns. Feel when the pulse stops. That's knowledge that can't be faked. And it's what will matter most when everything else goes wrong. If you live where help is close, the compact ETQ may be all you need. If life takes you into the mountains or the desert or on deployment, carry wide or carry both, carry multiple. Understand that sometimes one tourniquet isn't enough and that bleeding control isn't a one size fits all. It's a plan, a mindset, and a responsibility. A tourniquet you carry beats the one you left behind.